Hi everyone, and welcome back to the channel. Well, it's been a while, but I'm ready to tackle the second season of The Flash. Much like my previous video, I will review crossover episodes, but unless they're part of The Flash season, I will not include them in the ranking. With all of that out of the way, let's get on with the video. Alright, this was a solid series opener. So this episode picks up six months after the events of the season one finale and manages to do a good job filling in the gaps, while not following a traditional narrative flow. Barry has become cold and distant towards his friends, which makes sense as he blames himself for everything that happened after the singularity occurred, including the deaths of both Ronnie and Eddie. But I think the way the plot unravels this is good, so the episode opens in Barry's head. He and Team Flash take down Snart and Rory. Everything seems great up until the audience realised none of it was real. I think this plot did a good job of juggling all of Team Flash. Nobody felt left out here and it was a good examination of how they all dealt with the events that happened. Cisco and Joe felt like the highlights to me here, not giving up on Barry while also trying to aid the city as much as they could. Atom Smasher seemed like the appropriate villain here. He's just tricky enough of a foe that Barry would struggle on his own, but not so overpowered that he felt like more than just a villain of the week. Despite it being exposition, I think his allusions to Zoom were good, and it was a nice place to lay the seeds for this upcoming formidable opponent. Henry's release from prison was a great piece of plot development, but I do think it's out of character for the Reverse Flash to do this, unless he knew of some future event to do with Henry that would torment Barry further. Otherwise, it seems like Eobard would want to die with the knowledge that Barry will never be able to save his father. Jay Garrick's appearance at the end is a nice cliffhanger and a fun bit of fan service, especially if this was my first watch without prior knowledge. Someone should try and get through to him. Maybe his best friend. Joe, believe me, I've tried. I meant her. A great start to season two, so it deserved eight out of 10. Another decent one. I like how they introduced Jay into the story here. I know a lot of what he says is exposition heavy, filling everyone in on his earth. Normally, I would call this weak, but given that it's done in a narrative style with visuals of Zoom, I think it's done quite well. It does a good job of establishing him as an ally and illustrating the sheer might of Zoom. This is the first episode to introduce Patty Spivet, Joe's new partner and a potential love interest for Barry. I love her character. I think her bubbly personality and awkwardness mirrors Barry's own very well. The pair have natural chemistry together and I honestly wish she was Barry's endgame instead of Iris, or at the very least that she stuck around for a bit longer. The mystery behind Jay in this episode is done excellently too. Given that everything being presented is shown through Barry's perspective, it would make sense that he's so hostile towards Jay and doesn't seem filled with trust. But then again, last season, Eobard was manipulating everything and everyone so Barry's mental state wouldn't be the best especially with someone new being this close to his base of operations. I like that Zoom is dragging metahumans from his world to try to deal with the Flash. It gives a real organic reason for a continuation of the Villain of the Week trope. It also seems like a good narrative way to build up Zoom during this half of the series. So, a big introduction this episode is Joe's ex-partner and Iris' mother making a sudden appearance in his life. This is good, I think it gives some much needed character development to Iris and presents good plot points going forward. The episode ends with a fun cliffhanger on Earth too, that another version of Harrison Wells exists and is doing his own work in a parallel Star Labs. Given the doppelganger thing already established, this seems like the most natural way to keep Tom Cavanaugh relevant on the show. I enjoyed it, a very deserving 8 out of 10 here. Okay, this one was fun. Much like the previous, this rogue storyline introduces another character and actually fleshes the Snart family out some more. Louis Snart, Leonard and Lisa's father, is pulling a heist on Central City and essentially blackmails Leonard into helping him by threatening to kill Lisa. He implanted a bomb in her skin which Sisko attempts to remove. I think this is good. Meeting their abusive father gives them both depth as characters and shows the audience why they are the way they are. While this is going on, Jay and Caitlin build the speed cannon, stabilising the doorway between Earth 1 and Earth 2. I get the idea that they want to send Jay home, but on the other hand, they have just aided Zoom in travelling between locations, which isn't ideal for Team Flash. This episode has one of the best and most emotional scenes between Iris and Joe. I need to give the writing and acting credit. 
Watching Joe go to pieces explaining to Iris who her mother is and why he didn't want her to be an influence on her life makes sense. It adds even more depth to an already established great relationship on the show and is a good gateway to the Wally West introduction to come. Barry visiting Snart in Iron Heights was a fun little add-on as well. I think it aids in the continuation of their friend slash enemy dynamic. While pushing the argument that Barry has had for a while, that Snart isn't an entirely bad person, Yes, he's a criminal, but he has his own code, which he abides. It's clearly leading to a redemption arc and does a good job laying the groundwork for that. Much like the last, this episode ends on a Harrison Wells cliffhanger. He exits the portal on Earth 1. Not too bad of a story. I think 7.5 out of 10. This was a fun episode and better than I remembered. So, this kind of feels like a fish out of water plot. There's two possible candidates to fuse with Stein to become Firestorm. An ex-football player who lost his chance to go to college due to the particle accelerator, and an arrogant scientist who had always admired Stein. Their differences in character definitely carries this plot, especially as it's obvious the ex-sportsman Jefferson will become the fusion, whereas Hewitt becomes the villain of the week. Iris finally meets her mother and makes it quite clear that she isn't interested in pursuing any kind of relationship with her, which is fair given that she walked out on them as kids. Clearly her dying is dark and wouldn't be pleasant, but my reading of this confession was manipulative, especially when she said so Iris could miss her or something. This plot makes more sense now as Iris did some digging and discovered her mother walked out when she was pregnant with her son, this leading to the introduction of Wally West. I love Barry and Patty. Their sheer awkwardness is just so relatable to me. Every time I see them on screen, I'm annoyed that this didn't continue. But despite the horrible behind the scenes stuff, I do know at most this probably would have only been a season or two long romance, even though Barry and Patty have such amazing chemistry and are fun to watch together. The reveal of Earth 2 Harrison Wells saving Barry from King Shark was fun. If it weren't for Patty asking for help on the case, I would have called it a goofy end, but it was fun and an intriguing place to end an episode on. Not knowing Barry's reaction is a great cliffhanger to an episode. I'm already keen to see more. I'm not a huge fan of the Firestorm-centric plots. I think conceptually the character is interesting, but watching them I do find it a bit boring at times. This is probably their best one, so I'll be fair and give it an 8 out of 10. This was an interesting episode. So the episode opens up on Earth 2 amongst a bit of conflict between Earth 2 Harrison, or Harry as he is referred to, and Jay. First of all, in establishing Harry's involvement in creating Earth 2 metahumans and his ongoing feud with Jay. They clearly both want what's best for Barry, but can't seem to communicate with each other. Their physical confrontation was entertaining too. Okay, I was expecting Barry to be very suspicious and distrusting of Wells, when he actually wasn't. Cisco seemed to be the most distrusting of him, which is fine, we've already had an episode of this series being dedicated to Barry not believing Jay. I do think it sets a good personal dynamic up with Cisco this way too. So, the villain of this week, Dr. Light, is an Earth 2 counterpart to Barry's ex-girlfriend Linda. Zoom did this intentionally so Barry would hesitate, but then again, how does Zoom know so much about Barry? This coincides with Barry's date with Patty. During a fight with Dr. Light, Barry gets blinded and requires Cisco's help via camera with his date. I would argue this being a bit creepy, but the dialogue is funny and really carries the scene. The biggest reveal of this episode is purely that Zoom has captured Harry's daughter and is keeping her prisoner, something which becomes a major plot point this season. The episode ends with Barry gearing himself up to confront Zoom, despite being warned by Jay several times that he isn't ready and doesn't appreciate the threat level. This one was quite fun to watch. I think a 7.5 seems like a fair score to me. Wow, okay, this is one incredible episode. So, the episode opens with Dr. Light attacking Barry before cutting to the 72 hours earlier thing. Now, normally, I'm not a fan of this trope. I think it can be lazy and dumb for shock value. But given that it's the Earth-1 counterpart pretending to be Dr. Light, I think it works super well. So, the Flash formulates a plan to bait Zoom out with Harry and Joe ready to shoot a speed dampening dart at him as he exits the portal, which is a solid plot idea. Cisco vibes Harry and learns about Jesse's capture, which is another good plot point. I know this episode builds up to this via flashbacks and reveals their rocky relationship, but still. It makes it clear to both the audience and to Team Flash why Harry is so invested in taking Zoom down. I think it's a good parallel to the other Harrison Wells slash Eobard Fawn 
to see the motives be protecting his daughter from the biggest threat on Earth. This episode has such good suspense. It does an amazing job of building up Zoom, via the plan they attempt and how it seems to fail, when in actuality Zoom is several steps ahead of them and waits for their guards to be down before ambushing them. Which is great. Not just this episode, but the series as a whole so far has barely shown Zoom up until this point. It's relied solely on a fear factor and it more than delivers. Okay, so across all the Arrowverse shows, Zoom is without a doubt the scariest and most threatening villain. Not only in looks, but speech pattern and abilities. This episode just proves that. The whole thing is meant to be the quiet before the storm. Zoom shows up in the last five minutes and beats the living crap out of the Flash. He did more damage than any other villain up until this point. If Sisko hadn't caught him off guard and fired, Barry would be dead, despite the horrible state Zoom leaves him in. It's so jarring seeing this massive roadblock, Zoom took him down like it was nothing. This is the best introduction to a villain, a very, very earned 9.5 out of 10 for this one. I enjoyed this one, there was a lot to it. So directly following on from the last, where Zoom completely obliterated Barry and left him nearly dead, we see the aftermath of this, how mentally broken Barry is. He is left with real scars and feels completely immobilised, which is an interesting thing to do to his character. This is definitely the right move for the plot overall. Central City saw the power of Zoom, whereas the audience is now seeing how much of a threat Zoom is. In terms of the plot to the episode, we are reintroduced to Grodd, who feels lonely now that the Reverse Flash has abandoned him. I like the idea that he wants to create more super intelligent gorillas so that he no longer feels alone. Kidnapping Caitlyn seemed like the organic way to make something like that happen. Their rescue plan was great too. I loved Harry wearing Eobard's suit and pretending to be the Reverse Flash. His interactions with Grodd were fun, although the whole father and buddy titles were a bit cringe. I think bringing Henry back was clever too. I think he was the only person who could break Barry out of his mental state. The one exchange between the pair where Henry illustrates how he felt at his own trial for murder was excellent. Both him and Grant Gustin gave an incredible performance here. I honestly wish we had more scenes between these two this series as it was great. The resolution to the Villain of the Week plot was good. Barry regains his confidence and pushes Grodd through a portal into Earth 2 to live amongst other intelligent ape kind. It's a good way to bring both story beats together and sets up both Grodd and Solovar going forward in future plots. Finally, the Flash and Patty sort of make themselves official. I like that Patty challenges Barry and what's been going on, even though I thought Soup was a bit of a stupid plot device. This episode does some great setup by pushing Sisko's budding romance with Kendra Saunders, aka Hawk Girl, a character who is centric to the upcoming crossover with Arrow. Another solid 8 out of 10 plot. This was such a fun introduction to the crossover event. Okay, so much like last season, the Arrowverse shows have an annual crossover episode event. This time, the larger focus was on Hawk Girl and the team dealing with Vandal Savage, a bounty hunter whose life is entangled within Hawkman and Hawk Girl, a mortal being who gets stronger every time he kills this pair, two DC heroes who continuously reincarnate themselves with disguised backstories. But in this case, Hawk Girl is stuck in the facade of being Kendra Saunders. Her arc across this episode is one of the best character journeys the show has had so far. I think Vandal Savage is the right villain for this crossover. Last time, the larger focus was Oliver and Barry overcoming their differences, whereas now they're teaming up across two episodes to take on a larger threat. I think his supernatural abilities relay nicely to Barry, while his gritty fighting style and use of martial art weapons compares nicely to Oliver. He as a villain strikes a nice balance between the pair and is clearly a larger than normal episode threat. While I appreciate the cooler moments where the team have some downtime and intermingle, I would argue there is slightly too much of it here, and some more focus should have been on Kendra and Vandal. I think the way they introduced Hawkman was good too. The choreography on his fight with Oliver was fun and seemed reminiscent of the Injustice video game style of fighting. Everything they did with these two was excellent, and it's a good backdoor pilot to DC Legends so far. While I enjoyed the B-plot, I'm not sure it was too necessary. I did find it entertaining and true to character for Patty to try and take down Wells. I just felt like they could have found another way to get Jay to take the Velocity 9. However, I do like that the show has now introduced it, given the ties it holds to Zoom and the larger plot. This was enjoyable, so I think it deserves a 9 out of 10. 
Well, this is the second part of the yearly crossovers, this time the Arrow-centric episode. I think this episode has good setup and use of flashbacks. It begins with information back in ancient Egypt with Kendra and Carter and Vandal Savage, alluding to the asteroid activity and their centuries-long war of reincarnation. I like that this was done visually rather than it just being some throwaway exposition lines. As good as the visuals were here, especially in the first version of the timeline where Vandal destroys the team and the city, I wasn't a big fan of the use of time travel, specifically Barry seeing another version of himself as setup. The first time was great, but now I worry it'll become tiresome. I know time travel is a big part of the Flash's lore, but I think they could have implemented it better. That being said, I love how they used it to illustrate Oliver wasn't in focus due to his life falling apart. They definitely utilised main characters well to tell a larger story and the dynamics were good. I do think some of the cast were getting a bit left behind in the background though. I know it's a big cast, especially with three additional mains so not everyone will get the focus, but it seemed like they were there to pad the scene. The action shots were very entertaining to watch, especially the final confrontation with Vandal. I really liked the character work it did for Oliver and the plot it sets up going forward. Using a crossover to reintroduce Oliver's son was an interesting choice, but it did tie to Oliver's character motivations and had an effect on the plot, so in my opinion, it worked. This was a fun conclusion to the second major crossover. Christmas has gone rogue this time, as Weather Wizard broke Captain Cold and the Trickster out of prison. Okay, at first, I was expecting this to be another rogue episode, but one set during the holidays, as three of the main staples are there. Well, two anyway, as Snart decides to give Barry a heads up and leave them to it. Which is interesting. His character development is clearly continuing. He's no hero, but definitely isn't a villain anymore. There was just no stake for him in this plot. Everything to do with the weather wizard here was interesting. So he's the reason Patty doesn't have a father and the reason she became a cop. He killed her father and she blames both herself and him for it. She goes on a vigilante style hunt for Marden. All of this is interesting as it causes a rift between her and Barry as she questions her next moves. It was such a good divide for her character as normally her and Barry's chemistry is on top form. Barry and Iris decide they need to tell Joe about his son Wally. That Francine was pregnant when she left and he had no idea. It's very in character for Joe to be beating himself up over not being there for Wally. Which wasn't his fault, he had no idea Wally even existed, so it's hardly his fault he doesn't know about him. The first cliffhanger of this mid-season finale being Wally arriving at the door was such a good character beat to leave it on. While I think the trickster posing as Santa and handing kids bombs wrapped as presents was good and in character, I fail to believe that no kid would have opened that gift early, especially as they're the incentive for Barry not to fight and die at both of their hands. The other cliffhanger to the plot being Zoom blackmailing Harry into stealing the Flash's speed is great. I like that this is the basis rather than another Evil Wells again. I really had fun with this one, 9 out of 10. Well, if the Flash moves super quick then I guess the turtle moves super slow. Okay, as a concept, I like the still force and I think to some degree it was implemented well here. I like the idea that some dude in a green raincoat is casually robbing places. If that was all this plot was, then I would be cool with it. I think it gets a bit lost when they try to present more of a character. He doesn't give me serial killer vibes despite killing his wife and kidnapping Patty. If he was just some low level thug who tapped into the still force, then I would have been all for it. It could just be my reading or the way some of the scenes pan between Jay and Caitlin, but I think the audience are getting a bit suspect of him, especially as he's supposedly sick without his speed. Look, I've seen the series before, but they tell you from episode 1 who he is. His clothing and general demeanour show this. This episode is where Barry and Patty split up, which I'm not a fan of. Look, I totally understand that dodgy stuff was going on behind the scenes, and Chantal Van Santen was uncomfortable, which is totally fair, as she was originally going to appear all series. I do like how this episode put strain on her and Barry's relationship, but again I think her being kidnapped was too much. All that was needed was for Barry to feel a divide between his relationship and being the Flash. Trying to make the turtle more of a threat ruined it a bit. All of the Harry stuff is great. Tom Cavanaugh is nailing it again this season. The story behind Zoom's name is terrifying and highlights how out of touch from reality he is. The lengths Harry is going to to save Jesse is adding a lot of stakes, and using the turtle the way he did makes sense to the overall story. Eobard is back, and I'm very excited for the next episode.
This was fun to watch, but definitely the weakest of the season so far. 7 out of 10. This was an interesting episode with a lot going on. So this one really felt like an ending to a lot of established plots. We had Iris finally say goodbye to her mother, which wasn't something I expected to happen. She wasn't there throughout her childhood, and Iris made it clear she had no interest. I guess this means she will get closer with Wally. This episode sets up the idea of time remnants, something that will become a larger part of the show going forward. It also explains how a version of Reverse Flash can exist now. I'm really starting to enjoy the dynamic between Cisco and the various Wellses in the multiverse. Harry creating the vibe goggles is a good plot tool to move things along, especially with the episode plot of seeking out the Reverse Flash. This episode is the return of the Matt Letcher version of Reverse Flash. As much as I love Tom Cavanaugh's performances across this show, I do love this take on the character too. I wish we had more of him throughout the show. He's very menacing here, and I think the idea of Barry having to send him back to his time is interesting. Especially as Barry is more unhinged right now due to Patty going. Speaking of, Patty is moving away this episode, which is really hurting Barry. It's not just the breakup, but her leaving Central City altogether. I understand her wanting to chat to Barry and reconcile a little bit, but I also understand why Barry wouldn't want to. The scene with the train at the end was nice. It felt like the right final scene between them. I do kind of wish the rupture to the timeline and Sisko's side effects came directly from Fawn. Given what Sisko reveals to him about his powers and his role, I figured he would be manipulating time. The introduction of Earth-1 Hunter Zolomon is good and acts as a good plot deterrent. Even if it's a little bit obvious at this point, well, to me anyway. This was pretty solid. I'll give it an 8 out of 10. This was a fun episode. So this one introduces Tar Pit, who is one of my favourite rogues from the comics. While I thought he was portrayed well in this generic vengeance plot, I don't really feel like he was utilised to his fullest here. I feel like they could have done more, especially as there wasn't a great deal of fighting between him and Barry. Iris's meddling in Wally's life was interesting. On the one hand, it showed how brave she was, but I could also see it as annoying. Wally has only had her and Joe for a short time, so this level of meddling seems like a lot, even if it's coming from a good place. While, in this case, challenging an underground crime group of drag racers. I can see it from Joe's point of view too. He's scared that if he pushes Wally too far, he will lose his new son forever. It makes sense. I like Harry's struggle here. He feels like he's betraying a group of people that he has gotten close to. While at the same time, Zuma's threatened to continuously torture his daughter, especially as he and Barry bonded over attempting to close the breaches. I did like the tie to the previous episode, that Harry used tech from Eobard that he left from the previous episode. He used tech to dampen Barry's speed by 2%. So even though he comes clean after feeling guilty for Iris' attack, it's still a lot. I mean, Joe nearly kills him in a fury. Of all of the characters, it's interesting that it's Joe who's normally calm and collected. I think it's an intriguing debate. Harry's not a bad guy, but then again, if he were honest from the beginning, they could have got Jesse sooner. This one picked up a lot and was good. 8.5 out of 10. This is the first part of the Earth 2 adventure. Following on from the last episode, Barry and Sisko decide to accompany Harry back to Earth 2 so that they can rescue Jesse. Now, I was worried that this would be overly gimmicky and lose itself along the way, but that wasn't the case. Yes, fan service is definitely at play here, but I don't think it's overkill. They meet all the Earth 2 doppelgangers, which is fun. I especially like Earth 2 Barry. He's such a sweet and awkward boy. He is the best character from this Earth. It also gives an interesting insight into other characters, like Caitlyn and Ronnie being evil counterparts. In this case, Deathstorm and Killer Frost, with Reverb acting as their team leader. This is great as it gives a full-on allusion to Caitlyn's character development further along the show and flashes Zoom's team out. The dynamic between Earth 2, Barry, and Joe is interesting. That's where a lot of the personal drama comes from. Unlike the main Earth, this one has their Joe hate Barry, which is a fun difference, especially as there's solid reasoning. Iris had become a police officer to help Barry pay for his PhD. Joe feels like Barry is putting Iris' life at risk every day because of this. I know it's objectively a different character, but Joe's death was sad in this episode. I do also appreciate that this episode didn't forget Earth 1. Joe, Jay and Caitlin are dealing with their own metahuman without Barry's help. It was fun seeing Jay take him on to change it up a bit, and everything related to the velocity speed drug was intriguing. That's supposedly what damaged Jay and caused his sickness all along. 
This was fun setup and a solid watch. 9 out of 10 for this one. Well, this is the conclusion to the Earth 2 double bill. I really like the conversation between Barry and Jesse. Despite how dire the situation is, their conversation seemed warm. The two of them seem to have quite good chemistry together. I'm actually looking forward to seeing more of her character. Although as threatening as Zoom normally is, I did find him popping up a bit cheesy in these scenes. But him battering Barry brought him back to form quite quickly. Caitlin seemed to perfect the velocity drug, well enough for Jay to really utilise it and save people from a falling building. That was a good scene. Even though I find Geomancer to be quite a cringe villain, I'm just not really meshing with him. Iris has a new chief editor. I did find it quite funny how much he challenged Iris from the get-go. And from an outside point of view, it makes sense. To everyone else, the Flash has just gone. I think they're trying to imply something romantic here, but I don't recall his character sticking around for long. Somehow, Sisko was able to get through to Killer Frost. Look, I get it, the connection she has to Caitlyn on his earth, but I wish she would remain evil. I know she isn't good now, but it still felt a bit off and easy. But then again, it is a good plot device for her to temporarily stop Zoom. Earth 2 Barry gives a motivational speech too. Yeah, he's definitely Barry Allen, and I think I love him all the more for it. I'm, I'm sorry, he got frisky with you? <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, I'm gonna have to find this guy and give him a piece of my mind. I get the ending cliffhanger of Zoom killing Jay was meant to subvert audience expectation of who Zoom is, but I do feel like it's very on the nose. Especially as Eobard did the same thing with Wells last season, I wish they found another route. This was still a good episode, but a bit weaker than the first, so 8.5 out of 10? Well, this plot went swimmingly. All puns aside, this was very fun filler. So as the title implies, King Shark is the focus and the villain of the week this time. So still under Zoom's original orders, he is attempting to hunt Barry down and kill him. He is able to sense the electricity in Barry's system, so even if he's not in costume, he can still be found by the Shark Man. This show's CGI budget is questionable at times, so this particular rogue is a brave one to attempt. For the most part, they pull it off. This episode has a lot of character drama too. Caitlin is really struggling to deal with the fact that Jay is dead. It's very understandable how she's feeling. This ties nicely to her Earth 2 counterpart, Killer Frost, who Sisko is worried she is going to become in her devastated state. John Diggle and Lila from Arrow guest star in this episode. They come to hunt down Killer Shark and give Barry a warning. Them along with the Argus organisation are a nice addition. I particularly like the conversations between Diggle and Barry. It feels organic and real. I also like the similarities he points out between the Flash and the Green Arrow at this point. Barry attempts to bond with Wally and help with his engineering projects for university. It doesn't go so well. I kind of get it though. Wally must be quite jealous of Barry and envious of the life he had with Joe and Iris. I know that the relationship between The Flash and Kid Flash can be rocky in the comics, so the parallel is nice. Although aspects of it were awkward to watch, but I don't know if it's acting or writing. I'm glad the episode ended on the reveal. We know that Zoom is Jay, or fake Jay Garrick I guess. The audience know, but the characters don't yet. As much as I love Zoom as a villain, it was obvious. Even on the first watch through. As I said, this was filler, but entertaining filler, so I'm all good with it. I think an 8 out of 10 is fair enough here. Well, let's enter yet another speedster, Trajectory, who is also the villain of the week this time. As we know from a few episodes ago, Caitlyn created the Velocity drug to give Jay speed whilst Barry was away. Well, Caitlyn asked an old colleague for help with the recipe. She reverse engineered the recipe and is using the speed drug to rob people. This is good for a few reasons. First of all, it's an organic way for Barry to learn of the drug and how dangerous it is, and an interesting way to tie the villain of the week into the story. Her using the serum on Jesse is a good way to allude to Jesse Quick later on in the show. The cold open is fun too. Barry attempting to build up his speed by running over the waterfall was a fun scene. It was a pretty visual too, even if Barry wasn't fast enough to jump it. This episode included the meet cute between Wally and Jesse at a club. Their acting was good, but I don't know, the dialogue or the line delivery from Wally seemed off, but it was clear from Violet Bean's acting that Jesse liked Wally in that moment. While we're on the subject of Jesse, the conflict between her and Wells was really good. I can see it from both points though. From Harry's perspective, he was a desperate father and would do anything to get his daughter back. But I can see it from her point of view. The man she respected and looked up to all her life became a monster. The tracking device in the watch was a nice way to relay the information as well. 
although well saving a life via blood transfusion is a nice way to try and resolve their conflict. I like that Velocity 9 is the plot device here. Barry's view on it was good too. He understands the danger from it, but equally knows that everyone else he has faced is cheating as well. It puts him in a tough position and leads to a great scene and moment from Grant Gustin. I think given all the loss he has faced, it makes sense for Barry to be feeling this way. The ending is tense, the Velocity 9 changing colour highlights to Barry that Zoom is using it. That Zoom is dying and that Jay is actually Zoom. This was decent character work, 8 out of 10 seems fair. Alright, so this is a fun one. Barry decides the only way he can get faster in order to take on Zoom is by travelling back in time and getting advice from Fawn. Despite all the risks of time travel, he decides to go ahead and travels back to the time they took down Pied Piper for the first time. Barry crosses paths with his previous self and has such a great speed sequence. Seriously, the CGI is on top form here, some of the best from the whole show. He knocks his previous self out and assumes his identity for a while. Fawn sees through it and attempts to kill the future version of Barry. Knowing how the reverse flash would act, this Barry puts a contingency plan in place and essentially blackmails him into helping. Otherwise, everything he has schemed for for 15 years falls apart and he will never get home. Back in the present, all the characters seem distraught by the betrayal of Jay and that it has happened again, which is completely understandable given everything. This feels like quite a fanservice episode. It's fun having all the links to the first season along with Hartley. Utilising them to take down a time wraith is great too. It feels like they're using the available characters well. The redemption of Hartley at the end was nice and a good thing going forward. In addition to this is the return of Eddie. Seeing him on screen again was nice, despite the knowledge of his downfall coming in his future. I think the episode does a good job of showing off the time wraiths and how they function. If speedsters mess with time, they appear and attempt to stop them. They're essentially keepers of time. In this case, it heads towards past Barry for meddling with time, even with his good intentions. This plot does a good job as setting them up as a nasty threat. I love the interactions between Future Barry and Reverse Flash. They have such a seething hatred for one another. It was very entertaining to see on screen. This was solid and very entertaining, so 9 out of 10. Well, this is the other official crossover of the season, this time integrating Supergirl and all her affiliated characters into the Arrowverse. So after upping his speed, Barry accidentally ends up on Supergirl's Earth. He notices a girl fall from a window, in this case Cara Danvers and rushes over to save her. She got caught off guard by Silver Banshee who shrieked at her. I like that Barry did this not realising she's a superhero who can take care of herself, which makes the reveal all the funnier. Well that and how awkward Barry is when her shirt is on fire. I think Grant Gustin has incredible chemistry with the Supergirl cast. I could very easily believe he's a character within this show. Kara, Wynn and Jimmy all agree to help Barry get back to his Earth, despite how jealous Jimmy is getting that Barry and Kara are spending time together. Again, this is good, as it means the Flash's arrival isn't taking anything away from progressing the Supergirl plot points here. Livewire, another incredible rogue from Supergirl's library of villains, breaks out of custody and goes after Cat Grant this time teaming up with Silver Banshee. This is a fun parallel to the now team up between Supergirl and The Flash. I also feel like this balance is needed, otherwise it's two overpowered heroes taking on one villain. And Livewire is iconic, essentially Supergirl's Captain Cold, especially with a possible redemption arc on the horizon. I really love Barry and Wynn's growing friendship here. The pair are clearly fond of each other and enjoy their company. It's very similar to Barry's friendship with Sisko. The final fight was a lot of fun, Yes, yeah, CGI elements were a bit questionable, but ignoring that, it was good. I mean, the main gimmick here is the Flash and Supergirl teaming up, so in that regard, this fight really was world's finest. I'm sorry for the pun. I haven't watched a lot of the crossover stuff recently, bar Barry and Oliver, so I forgot how good Grant and Melissa are on screen together. I think ending the episode with a homage to the famous comic book race between the Flash and Superman was really cool. It's the only way I could think to end such a fun crossover. I really enjoyed this one. Well, I was waiting for this. We officially have the origin story of Hunter Zolomon slash Zoom. So much like Barry, his mother was killed, but this time by his father in a rage, leaving him an orphan. Unlike Barry, he didn't have a support system in place like Joe and Iris, so he was left to fend for himself in an orphanage. This is such a strong reveal and really shows how easily Barry could have become a villain like him. This is one of the darkest points this show has and I love it. 
To be fair, it felt more akin to a Batman project, in a good way. I think Sisko being the catalyst for future time travel between Earths is a good plot tool, especially as this ability was set up before on Earth 2, as his evil doppelganger was able to do the same thing. I found the pep talk between Joe and Harry very good. It felt so similar to the conversation in the first season between Joe and Wells, before the reveal that he was completely evil. As fathers, it makes sense how much they collectively worry for Barry, Wally, Iris and Jesse. I didn't think the chat between Caitlin and Iris about Barry was needed. I found the whole thing cringe. It just doesn't feel like they set up the romance between Barry and Iris well in the whole show. The fact that Harry unintentionally creates Zoom was very good too. Much like the other parallels this episode, it was fun having the hero of that Earth create the villain. Again, similar to Eobard creating the Flash in Season 1. And the horror he feels at learning that Jay is the serial killer Hunter Zolomon pushes this so much more. Tom Cavanaugh just kills every speech he has, it's amazing. Using Wally as the final plot tool was good. Despite his differences with Barry, he was never going to let him die. It makes sense why Barry would hand a speed over in this case. I also think it's a fun illusion that both him and Jesse were in that cage and both will gain speed powers. I didn't like the speech Caitlin gave Zoom to stop him killing Barry. Zoom is a serial killer with no emotions or empathy. She shouldn't have been able to stop him. It contradicts him as a person. 8.5 out of 10. I think this is quite a divisive plot overall. So carrying on from last episode, Barry doesn't have his speed. I think the adjustment to his life is an interesting concept and I wish the episode focused in on it more than what we got. The episode opens with it, but that's all we really get exposed to of it. I mean sure, in fights he has no powers, but that's a given. I think seeing Barry rather than the Flash struggle is more intriguing. This episode was a good character piece for Jesse and Harry. It makes sense why she isn't happy to see him at first. She's carrying the pain and guilt of everything he did in an effort to keep her safe. It's the wedge between them and transitions nicely into the villain of the week. I do like that for the most part they talk it out at the end and somewhat resolve things. So as just stated, we have a villain of the week here, Griffin Grey, an interesting choice. So unlike most of this category, he has a unique quirk that sets him apart. The use of his powers is aging him and will eventually kill him off completely. He blames Wells and the Particle Accelerator, which is why he kidnaps him. Harry coming face to face with this is good reasoning for him to try to recreate the explosion to get Barry his speed back. The dynamic between Caitlin and Killer Frost was interesting. She was clearly being manipulated by her, but I found their interactions entertaining to watch. The only major letdown being the cringe dialogue Killer Frost had. Apart from that, it was alright. The cliffhanger reveal that Zoom wants to conquer every Earth starting with Earth 1 was fun. It seems like the natural place to take his character next, while subtly alluding to the fact we're close to the season finale now. This episode was alright. Definitely a weaker one this season, but there's just been so many consistently good ones recently. I think 7.5 out of 10 is fair. This was a fun episode with a lot going on. First of all, I found the use of the Flash simulation to be a fun plot tool. I get that the citizens of Central City would be questioning where the Flash has been all this time. It feels like a good way to fill in the gaps and a chance for the writers to be unique in their storytelling as he can't make direct contact. This one reintroduced Henry and the conversation he had with Barry back in the log cabin was really good and entertaining to watch. I like how it sets up the point of Barry always being a hero and not needing to be the Flash. I think these scenes with Henry are underrated. They always feel very real. As mentioned previously, I don't like the hole Caitlin has on Zoom. Yes, he references it and alludes to it being broken via betrayal, but still. He's an emotionless murderer who has slaughtered hundreds of people. This emotional tie damages that. I know there needed to be an organic roadblock to prevent him killing main characters, but they should have done something else. The conflict between Harry, Joe and Henry is also really great here. They're debating the speed issue and whether or not Barry should go through with it. I particularly like Henry's point of view that even if it works, Zoom will take it again and break Barry mentally even more. The fact that this argument comes from Barry's mentors across the show is great. I loved the second Particle Accelerator explosion scene. The visuals were some of the best of the whole show and the way it builds up was really good. I think it ended on such a strong cliffhanger. I mean, Barry isn't dead, obviously, but the other characters' reactions sell the possibility. The allusion to a possible second speedster is awesome too, only it's not Wally as most would speculate. This was another solid and enjoyable watch. I'll give it 8.5 out of 10.
This is one of my favourite episodes of the show. So despite the explosion and Barry disappearing last episode, he isn't really gone. Barry ends up in the Speed Force. But before he is allowed his powers back, he needs to go on an emotional journey of acceptance. This whole thing is a great character piece for Barry. Once again, coming to terms of losing his mother and accepting the mental hurdles he will need to overcome to be the Flash. While this is going on, the particle explosion accidentally made a zombified version of Gerda. You know, Barry's metal bully villain from season 1. Who once again has a lot more screen time than I think he deserves. To me, this feels more like fluff and a reason to add more tension which I don't think was necessary. Jessie is in a coma, that's all the tension you need for a side plot. Have the side plot focus on her and her origin. This is meant to be paralleling how Barry became the Flash in the first season, only she will become Jessie quick now. I enjoy what they did with her, and the fact that Henry was looking out for her. Despite what happened to Barry, I like that all the parental figures were trying to help each other's children. The method Wells used to anchor Sisko to the Speed Force was good. The Runaway Dinosaur being a children's book Barry's mum read to him as a child was a genius way of tying plot points together. It was a good way to parallel story and brought the plot to a good conclusion. I wish this episode had a larger focus at Barry's journey in the Speed Force, as those interactions are really great. The good a plot point was not needed. Despite this, it was really great and one of the better episodes. I think a 9 out of 10 is a good score for this. It's an interesting first part to the finale. So the opening action shot was a lot of fun. I think it's one of the biggest executed shots of the whole show and almost had like a cinematic sense to it. Like a much larger superhero scene. Very much sets up the stakes and tone for the finale. I mean, if Zoom hadn't have been doing that this whole season. This episode has a further tie to Arrow and the larger universe, as Black Canary's doppelganger from Earth 2 arrives and attacks Mercury Labs. This is a fun character piece and a good way of reintroducing a version of Laura Lance into Arrow. I like the idea that they're pushing this season, that Zoom and Barry are the same. They reflect each other, same tragic backstory with a mother's death, same anger and pain they have suffered all their lives, the only difference being how they were raised after the event. The idea that Zoom will always win because he has no morals and isn't looking to help others is intriguing. It makes sense logically. I do find the overly positive Barry a bit annoying though. I mean, I know it will be to his detriment in the end, but still. Given his journey in the Speed Force, I understand why he's acting this way though. On the one hand, I like the frequency charged weapon to take down all Earth 2 metahumans, but on the other hand, it's not that entertaining to watch on screen. Give us another fun fight like we had with the Flash and Black Siren. The Tina McGee tied to Henry is a fun little callback to the 90s Flash series which starred them both. Zoom dragging Henry back to the childhood home and murdering him in front of Barry is the best and saddest cliffhanger of the whole show. It was such a big way to raise the stakes and shows what length you will go to in order to prove he and Barry are the same. It's such a well done final scene. This episode was good, but it didn't hit as hard as I hoped, so an 8.5 out of 10. A fun finale to a great season of television. The introductory scene is so powerful. It pretty much picks up from where the last one finished off. Barry goes absolutely berserk and kills one of the Zoom time remnants. This was so good and for a moment it seems like Zoom really has broken him, to the point of no return. It shows just how dark and threatening Zoom has become as a major villain of the show. The funeral scene is also very powerful. It seemed to really connect the cast and illustrates just how in danger everyone is now. Although, he wasn't a major member of Team Flash, I will miss this version of Henry being on the show. The whole race idea is absolutely twisted. Ignoring any other plans he has for destruction, I think the race and his eagerness shows his narcissism. So it's not just him breaking Barry and wrecking his life, it's conquering every Earth, wrecking them all and being the only speedster. I'm not sure how I feel about them sidelining Barry. I wish they came up with another way to extend the plot a bit. Like I know the team want what's best for Barry and are scared in his current state he won't stand a chance against Zoom, which is probably true actually. I just wish they came up with another idea to combat this plot point. If a bit exposition heavy, I like the detail Zoom gave Joe about his backstory, that his breach allowed him to see Barry before travelling to Earth 1. The Speed Force remnants set up and follow through is a good allusion to Zoom's setup and coming fate. And the reveal that Jay Garrick, the Flash of Earth 2, is the one chained up in Zoom's lair is a fun nod, especially as he's a doppelganger of Henry Allen. 
Barry creating his own time remnant as a tool to stop Zoom was a good callback. It shows how much better Barry has got over the season, especially as Zoom is the toughest threat of the show so far, and him becoming trapped as a Speed Force guard is a good ending to his character. I think the final scene with Barry running back in time and preventing his mother's death is good setup for the season 3 opener, especially as it's Flashpoint which is my favourite Flash comic. Another 8.5 for the finale, I think. This was such a solid series of television. You have a more experienced version of The Flash, who has some very difficult hurdles to overcome. His team is really starting to bud and the character journeys were coherently tied to the overall plot. In terms of the characters themselves, I really liked Harry and Jesse. I think having a version of Wells who's so emotionally vulnerable and broken was a good juxtaposition to Eobard disguised last season. His motivation for carrying on being Jesse made perfect sense. Whereas I think Jesse was a fun addition to the cast, but didn't contribute all that much after the kidnap plot. I wasn't the biggest fan of Wally in the past, but I definitely appreciate him and his dynamic with Iris and Joe a lot more this time around. I like the moments between him and Joe, they were some of the nicest character beats this season. This season really started pushing the romantic tension between Barry and Iris. Look, this is nothing against Candace Patton, she seems like a great actress, I just don't like or feel compelled by her dynamic with Grant Gustin. I much prefer their relationship in the comics than here. I honestly wish they continued Barry and Patty's relationship. That seemed much more organic, especially as they're both massive dorks in this, it's just perfect to me. I think Caitlin had the biggest side plot this series as she was the one person who seemed to have some level of control over Zoom. As Hunter Zolomon, he was in love with her. It was twisted, but apparent. As I've said during my reviews, I don't like this. I think it weakens his character as he's a self-absorbed monster on a rampage. Speaking of Zoom, he is the scariest Arrowverse villain and it's not even close. He brings the whole city to its knees and strikes fear into everyone. By comparison, the likes of Red Death looks like a joke. But I wasn't sold on Jay implementing himself into Team Flash. It's far too similar to the first season of the show, and it's very clear that he is Zoom. I mean, he wears a black leather jacket and seems rough around the edges. Clearly he's Zoom. I'm sad about Henry's death, but it really did raise the stakes and make Zoom a comparable villain to Reverse Flash. Well, here it is, my ranking for The Flash Season 2. Honestly, that was much harder to rank than season 1. This season is very consistent in quality. Well, that's just my thoughts. I would love to hear what you all think in comments down below. If you enjoyed what you saw, then please hit that like button and subscribe. It will help my channel continue to grow. Hopefully the season 3 reviews will be out sooner this time. With that, I'll see you all on the next one.